ready. Um, I'm told I have about 30 minutes. Um, in the past, I usually do this talk in 90 minutes, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but I do have one thing going for me, though, which is no demos. So nothing, nothing <laughs> to go for me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, troubleshooting deep neural networks. And so, you know, first, just kind of why, why am I here talking to you about this? You know, I do research in um, deep learning and robotics. Um, and, you know, this has kind of been like a, a, an offshoot, like a passion project that's come out of my research because, um, in my view, and this is something that really surprised me when I started to learn about deep learning, um, is that troubleshooting is really like the single hardest thing about deep learning. Um, and, you know, when I first started doing it, I thought it's because I was bad at it, but um, what I grew to learn was that, like, even top practitioners spend most of their time doing this. Um, but one thing that I've learned is that I think what the majority of people who are really good at this are actually doing when they're troubleshooting is following a pretty simple decision tree. Um, so the goal of this talk is to present the decision tree that I use when I'm, uh, when I'm troubleshooting. Um, just, so I have a quick sense, how many of you kind of work with deep learning on a regular basis? Okay, a handful. How many of you have like at least you know trained deep neural networks before? You know, taken class and along those lines. Okay, so the majority. Um, so you know, I alluded to this, but you know, why talk about troubleshooting? Um, I think like when I talk to people, really, it seems like it's as much as eighty or ninety percent of the time is on just this. And you know, the what what people think of as the fun stuff, like implementing new things or deriving math, um, training models, is really like ten or twenty percent. Of the time. And so the first thing that I want to do is try to give you some sense of um, you know, why this is actually so hard. Like, why are the best people spending their time on this? So just a, you know, by way of example, suppose that you, know, you have some result from some paper that you're trying to reproduce. And you know, the result is a learning curve that looks like this. Um, this is the learning curve from the original ResNet paper, um, which is kind of a landmark result in uh, computer vision. And you know, you implement the ResNet and you train your ResNet, and your learning curve looks like this. So, the way it works. Um, how many people have like have experienced this before firsthand? Yeah, the exact same set of people that said that they've trained deep learning models before. So, um, you know, so and so, you know, like, wh why is like so? The, really, the challenge here is, you know, um, we know that something is wrong because our result looks different, but. Um, just looking at the learning curve doesn't actually give, any, give us any information about why this is wrong. And so, you know, even if you're lucky enough to know that you do have a bug in your code, um, there are many different possible sources for the same degradation and error. It could be a problem with your training data, it could be a bug in your implementation, it could be a problem with your hyperparameters. And um, what's worse than that is that the results that you get can be very sensitive to kind of small changes that you make in your implementation and in the hyperparameters that you choose for your algorithm. Um, so small adjustments in, in your parameters can lead to big changes in results, um, which is challenging. And so the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, what do we do about this? Like, what's a strategy you can use to kind of minimize these effects? So I think the, the strategy actually starts with the mindset. Um, so I think there's one mindset that's really important to have when you're troubleshooting um, deep learning models. Uh, any ideas what that might be? No ideas. Uh, stubbornness. What's that? Stubbornness. Stubbornness. That's very, very close. I actually kind of wish I said that, but um, pessimism. Yeah. <laughs> um, very important to be pessimistic when you're troubleshooting. Um, and so the, you know, there, there's a reason for this, though, which is um, since it's so hard to disambiguate errors, you know, it's hard to tell what caused your degradation in performance. Um, you know, really the key is to start simple and very gradually layer on um, different sorts of complexity. Right? So I think the most common mistake that people make when they're training deep learning models is they read a really cool paper and they're like, yes. And they, and, you know, they go and sit down and they spend an afternoon and they cut up the model in TensorFlow and then they run it and it doesn't work. This is like a very natural instinct to have, but it's exactly the wrong thing to do. And so I think, you know, the strategy that I employ is a few different steps. Um, so you start um, by starting simple. And, you know, what that means is you start with the simplest possible version of your model and the data set. Um, and then from there, you implement your model and you debug it. 
And so this means you know, getting it to run and then convincing yourself that there's no kind of implementation errors in your model. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, and then once you've implemented it and you're you know, reasonably certain that it's bug free, then you evaluate it, meaning you look at the performance on your validation set, let's say. And, um, and from there, you make a decision. And that decision comes down to, you know, are you overfitting or are you underfitting or something else? And, um, and then from there, you can make a decision about what to do next. Um, and you know, kind of the most common things that you might do are improve your data set, improve your model to your hyperparameters, um, or um, you know, if it's good enough, it might just be done. And so I'm gonna walk through each of these steps. But you know, before you even get to this point, it's, it's pretty important that you have a few things in place in your project. Um, you need to have some sort of test set or validation set that you're going to look at your performance on. Um, you need to have a, a single metric that you're trying to improve. Right? So in the real world, machine learning projects are complicated. You care about many things. Um, but machine learning tends to work best when there's a single number that you're trying to drive down. Um, and so at any given time, it's helpful to pick one um, and, and you know, focus on improving that metric. And then the last thing that you kind of need in order to start using this, this procedure is a target performance. And this could be based on a lot of things. It could be based on you know, the paper that you read, it could be based on human level performance, um, or even something really, really simple, um, like you know, the best linear regression model you can come up with. But you need some way of telling you know, on an absolute scale if your model is doing anything reasonable at all. And I'll use a running example um, here of pedestrian detection, kind of a, actually a simplified version of pedestrian detection. Um, so the problem is you have some data um, that looks like camera images, and your goal is to predict zero or one, yes or, uh, no or yes, is there a pedestrian in this image? And um, for the sake of, um, of argument here, we're gonna say our goal is to get to 99% classification accuracy. Um, though, if any of you in the room are, are working on self-driving cars, um, I hope that you're aiming much higher than this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so going back to our strategy, the, the first step is to start simple. Um, so what does this mean? Um, there's a few steps here. Um, the first step, I think, is choosing a simple architecture. Um, and, you know, I think architecture selection is like one of the things that's very mystifying to people about deep learning because, you know, if you um, follow the, the, the academic literature or you follow kind of the popular press, there's, you know, a new acronym, like a new five-letter acronym or some even six-letter acronyms, you know, every week. And it's like, it's hard to figure out which one to use. Um, but the good, good news is that I think when you're starting your project, the, cho the choice that you make about architecture can actually be very simple. Um, and you know, there's kind of um, two or three main categories of data that you typically use for deep learning. Um, one is images, and if you're using images, then my recommendation is you use a Lynette-like architecture, kind of the simplest possible ComNet architecture. Um, and later, as your project evolves, you might move to something that looks like a ResNet. Um, if your data is sequences, so you know, temporal data, language, um, audio, something like that, then you know, my recommendation in the past has been um, an LSTM with one hidden layer. Um, recently, it seems like there's a lot of evidence that temporal convolutions, for those of you who know what those are, um, are kind of easier to train and perform better than simple LSTMs, so you might consider starting there instead. Um, and then as your project matures, you move to something more state-of-the-art, and for sequences, um, state-of-the-art right now is kind of these attention-like models or these wave -like. Uh, wave nets like models. And then if your data is something else, um, you know, fully connected neural net with a single hidden layer is a reasonable starting point. Um, and for all of these, you know, the optimal model for your problem is not going to be on this list. It's going to be very problem dependent. But the point of this is to, um, as you're starting to, to add the first few layers of complexity to have something that's going to give you reasonable performance. And as you become confident, then you can move to something more state of the art. Okay, but you know, for a lot of real-world problems, we don't actually just have images or sequences or like one data type at all. Um, we might have multimodal data, and so um, you know, there's a very simple way to deal with multimodal data, and that's you know, say we have a problem like this one where we have three inputs, um, two images, um, and then a sentence, and the goal is to determine whether the sentence applies to the images. So, um, are these two things pictures of cats in this case? So, what might a simple architecture of this look like? Um, well, the first step is to map each into a lower dimensional space using the um, simple choices of architecture from the previous slides. Um, 
So for the, the images, a simple comnet, for the sentences, an LSTM. And then you get kind of a, um, an intermediate representation. And the key here is that these should all be more or less the same dimension. Um, then you concatenate them. Um, so just stack them on top of each other. <laughs> um, and then you pass them through a couple of fully connected layers um, to an output. Um, so again, this is kind of, if you've worked with deep learning before, this will seem like very, very obvious to try. Um, but the point is that um, it's often very, very hard to beat the obvious thing to try. And so you might as well start there. All right, so we have, you know, we've chosen our simple architecture. Um, and the next step is to choose um, sensible default values for your hyperparameters for this architecture. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on this um, because of limited time, but and you know the good news is here, um, if you're using PyTorch or um, something like that, then usually the defaults in those libraries um, now in 2019 are pretty sensible. Um, you know, in 2016 or 2017, this was like very much not the case. Um, but one thing I do want to say here is um, I always start with no regularization and no batch normal or no normalization of any kind. Um, this kind of often surprises people, but um, these things introduce a ton of bugs, and they're not really necessary for a goal in version one of our model. Um, another important thing is you, know, you should always normalize your inputs to your model. Um, in deep learning, this tends to actually make a really big difference, unfortunately. So you know, subtract the mean and divide by the variance. Um, and then lastly, you know, usually when I'm starting on a new problem, I think one thing to really consider is simplifying the problem itself. So this could be something like, you know, if you have a massive data set, you might use a subset of the data set. Um, you might build a simpler synthetic version of your data set so you can generate infinite data if you need to. Um, or you might consider using you know, fewer object categories or um, you know, uh, slicing your data in some meaningful way. And coming back to our, our running example of pedestrian detection, what might this, um, this simplified version look like? So we might start with, you know, we're a self-driving car company, so we have millions of images. Um, we might start with a subset of 10,000 of them and use, you know, again, a very simple convolutional neural network architecture um, and, um, you know, use the ad optimizer with the magic learning rate. This is the magic, like, this is always learning rate, right? it's magic. I can't tell you why, but it is. Um, and no regularization. And so, you know, just to summarize, um, you know, we've chosen kind of like a baseline model architecture for our task. We've um, used kind of the sensible defaults that we have in our um, in our library, normalize our inputs, and we've kind of cut down the problem into a more meaningful meaningful subset that we can start working on. And so, the next step here is to um, actually go and implement our model and debug it. Um, there's a few things that can go wrong when you're implementing a model. The, the first and the most nefarious is sometimes the model just doesn't run at all. Um, and then sometimes, um, but what's actually more challenging to deal with than that is, um, often what happens is your model runs, but um, the performance is bad. And so the next um, steps that I recommend here are to overfit a single batch of data, and then to compare it to some known result, to get some absolute sense of how well your model is doing. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about each of these, but first I want to talk about um, kind of what I have seen to be the five most common um, deep learning bugs in my experience. Um, these are really in no particular order, but the first one is incorrect shape for your tensors. Um, so, you know, um, TensorFlow and some of these other automatic differentiation libraries do um, automatic silent broadcasting of your tensors, which is a really convenient feature, but it can also lead to some um, some nasty bugs. Um, Pre-processing your inputs incorrectly, or actually more generally, just problems with your data pipeline. Um, I think for a lot of people with a machine learning background, this is kind of not your first instinct to look at, but is actually a cause of a ton of bugs um, in deep learning, uh, from my experience. Um, incorrect inputs to your loss functions. So in each of these libraries, your loss functions expect something maybe like low digits, um, but you know often you'll kind of um, you'll apply like a softmax to it before you pass it to the loss function. Um, there's nothing that catches this in TensorFlow, but it'll just kind of, your model won't train. Um, forgetting to set up train mode for the net correctly. Um, this particularly causes problems with batch norm, which is one reason why I don't recommend starting with batch norm. And then numerical instability. Um, so, you know, which usually comes from 
exponentiating something or taking a log or dividing by a, a small number, um, but it can kind of pop up later in training. A couple of pieces of kind of general advice for implementing your model. Um, the first is I always recommend that people start with a very lightweight implementation. Um, and so, you know, my, my rule of thumb is um, less than 200 lines of code when I'm trying to do machine learning idea. Um, and actually, I usually shoot for under 100. Um, you know, this doesn't count like TensorFlow, right? Like, you know, TensorFlow has many thousands of lines of code, and it's okay to use those. Um, whenever possible, I recommend using off-the-shelf components. Um, Keras is a great example of this. Uh, I think Keras is great, and a lot of people who are like very hardcore machine learning people kind of um, uh, look down their noses at it because it's, it does a lot of stuff for you. Um, but you know, the reality is, your job here is like to try to eliminate all the possible sources of error. And so, if you use someone else's really good implementation, then that can only help you. And you know, the last thing I would say is just implement complicated data pipelines later. So, usually, the first time I'm creating a model for a new problem, I'll use a data set that I can fit in memory. And you know, all of this like um, uh, data preprocessing stuff is like super, super valuable later on, but um, is a very common source of error when you're when you're just starting out. Um, okay, so we've talked a bit about getting your model to run, um, overfitting a single batch. The idea here is actually to get, make sure the training error can go all the way to zero. Um, and if it can't, then you know, typically like the things I would take a look at are is the does the input data look reasonable for our, you know, for example, your labels getting shuffled up. Um, and then you can play around with the learning rate just to make sure it's within a reasonable range. Um, and those are kind of usually the main causes of problems. Um, and then, you know, once you can overfit a single batch, the next thing I recommend doing is finding some result that you can compare your model's performance to. Um, but not all results are created equal. Um, the best that you can do is if there's some official implementation of the model, um, like if it's ResNet, then there's an official implementation in TensorFlow. And if you can compare to that, then the great thing is you can step through your model line by line and see where it differs. Um, from the official implementation. Um, but even super simple things, like just a linear regression model, um, are, are better than nothing. Because then at the very least, you can tell when your velocity of your model goes down, is it actually doing something meaningful at all? All right, so the next step is to, um, is to try to evaluate your model. Um, and so, you know, once you think your model is bug free, then how do you figure out, like, we've started with something really simple, how do you figure out which, uh, which layers of improvement to prioritize? Um, and so I think this, the strategy for doing this is just applying the, the bias variance decomposition. Um, so, you know, for, for those of you in data science, like, hopefully this is a familiar concept. Um, but, you know, the idea is you have, like, some, some kind of target performance, which is this blue line, you know, maybe it's human level performance on your problem. And then you have the training error of your model that kind of approaches that, that performance, hopefully. Um, then, usually if you plot your validation error, it falls above that training error. And, um, and then if you can evaluate on your test set, your test error will usually fall above the validation error. And so, the key idea here is, if you look at the difference between those curves, um, so the difference between the blue line and the green line um, is, uh, your your avoidable bias. So this is a measure of how much you're um, how much you're underfitting the data set. And then the difference between the the, um, the green and the red is your variance. So how much you're um, you're overfitting uh, to your training set. And then you know if you evaluate on the test set, which you shouldn't do very often, but when you do, if there's a gap between your validation performance and your test uh, performance, then that's a measure of um, how much you're overfitting to your validation set. And so we're going to use these numbers to prioritize um, what to do next with our model. Um, and so the summary here is just, you know, your test error is some measure um, irreducible error plus your, your bias, plus your variance, plus your validation set of fitting. And so you're decomposing your error into these uh, four component parts. There's one assumption kind of under the hood here, which is this assumes that your training, valid and tests all come from the same data distribution. Um, for a lot of real-world problems, that's not the case. Maybe it's hard to collect data from, your, from the distribution that you ultimately care about. And so the question is, you know, what do you do? Um, 
you know, so maybe, for example, like maybe it's way easier for you to collect data during the daytime, but at test time, you actually need to make sure that you can still perform well um, at night. And the idea here is to use, instead of one validation set, to use two validation sets. One that's sampled from um, the distribution of your training data, and the other that's sampled from the distribution of your test data. And if you add this um, extra validation set to the, um, to the, to the learning curve that we have here, you know, this will usually fall somewhere between your, um, your training error and your test error. So like usually your, your validation error on your training set is slightly worse than your training error, which is slightly better than your validation error on your test set. And so this adds another component to um, how we broke down our total loss. So it's, um, you know, whereas before it was a sum of four things, now our test error is a sum of um, you know, some irreducible error, our bias, our variance, and then a distribution shift, which is the difference between our train valve score, our test valve score, and our validation set of fitting. Okay, so um, you know, now, that we, now that we've made some assessment about what's happening to our model on our um, validation set, so what do we actually do about that? Um, I think there's a clear order to address these things, and it starts with addressing underfitting, and then addressing overfitting, and then distribution shift, and then kind of finally rebalancing data sets to deal with validation set overfitting. Many strategies to, um, to address underfitting. Um, I think the simplest and most effective of all these is just making your model bigger. And so that's usually the thing I would try first. Um, but, you know, Oftentimes, as you get more mature in your project, and like really the thing that ends up making a big difference here is you know, moving away from the simple architecture that we chose to something that's closer to state of the art. And you know, to come back to our running example, like say that we had, you know, when we trained our initial model, we had a big gap between our training error and our goal performance. So this tells us that we're pretty severely um, underfitting our training set. And you know, so the first thing that we might try is just adding more layers to the content. And that might drive our training error down. Um, and so then you know, from there, we might switch to a uh, more modern neural network architecture like ResNet 101. And that might drive our training error even further down. And then we might um, tune hyperparameters, which might you know, then eventually get our, um, our training error down to below the threshold that we're targeting. And kind of the, the important thing here is that um, we're, we're actually not like really worrying so much about the validation error when we're doing this. Like we're just trying to make sure that we can get our training error to be good enough on, um, on this data set. Um, and then once it is, then we're gonna start worrying about overfitting. I think this is like kind of one of the key differences between um, deep learning and more traditional machine learning. All right, so now our training performance is kind of where we want it to be, and so the next step is to address overfitting. Again, um, many things that you can try here. Um, not all are created equal. Um, I think the simplest and by far the most effective is just adding more training data. Um, again, I, think, I, I actually want to restate this because this is super, super important. Like in deep learning, um, the best way to make your model perform better on your validation set is just to get more data. Um, now, the strong caveat here is that like this is not actually always possible. Right, like for a lot of problems, it's really expensive to collect data if you even can, and it's expensive to label data. And so there are a lot of other things that you can try. Um, uh, I think actually like batch norm and other types of normalization work really well here, um, as do uh, regularization and data augmentation. But if you can, my recommendation is always to try to add more data. Coming back to our, our running example, um, so where we got to before is we have you know, really good training data, better than our goal performance, but our validation error is um, not looking so good. So what do we do about that? Well, remember we started with this small um, subset of our training set, which is only 10,000 images. So the hypothesis is that this is like one of the big causes of us overfitting. So we might increase the data set size to 250,000, which will help a lot. Um, and then we might add weight decay, which is a form of regularization, um, maybe add some data augmentation, and then finally tune some hyperparameters. Um, because our, our training error had shot back up. And so, you know, in this, in this example, like maybe this will be good enough to get our validation performance um, where it needs to be. 
So the next step is, you know, once your model is performing well on your train valve set, then the next step is to make sure that it performs well on your test valve set. And so, you know, what do you do if there's a distribution shift? Right? So if your training data and your validation data are not the same. Um, you know, if you can just collect more data that you know comes from your, your validation set, then that's great. You should do that. But if you can't, then um, there's actually like a, a, a process here that works really well that's super manual, um, which involves like actually looking at the errors that you make on your test file set and your train file set, and then kind of picking out the major error categories and um, specifically collecting or synthesizing more data to address those error categories. And I'll, I'll give an example of kind of how um, how do I go about this? So you know, suppose that like these are the errors that your um, that your model is making on um, kind of test valve set and train valve set. Um, and so you know, the next thing we're going to try to do is to try to like group these errors in some way or categorize them. And so you know, these um, first couple of, of errors, you know, it's actually really hard to see in the pedestrian. Um, so you know, maybe it's fair that the model is making a mistake here. Um, there's a second type of error which seems to be when there's reflections on the, wind, on the windshield. And then there's a third type of errors um, that we're only seeing in the, in the test valve set, and those are the errors that are coming from the ACs. And okay, so, um, you know, if, if I was looking at this and, um, and trying to figure out um, what to do next, you might think about um, a couple of things. The first is, like, how big a contributor are each of these sources of error to your overall error rate? And then and how hard are they to fix? Right, so um, you know the, this first error type of detecting of like these kind of hard to see pedestrians that you know humans can't even tell that they're in the image. Um, that's just really hard to fix because if you know if we can't tell how to do it, then why should a computer be able to tell how to do it? Um, and it's all it's also a very very small contributor to the error. Let's say. Um, but on the other hand, night scenes um, maybe this is a big contributor to the error, and it's also relatively easy to fix because we can just go more uh, collect more data at night. Or we can even try to synthesize data. Um, we can try to transform our daytime data so that it looks more like that data in some way. And then the, the last step here is, you know, um, periodically, you should check your performance on your actual held out test set. And if you start to notice a gap between your validation performance and your test performance, that means that you've, you know, evaluated your model and your validation set too many times, and you've started to, um, you know, to, to overfit to that validation set. And the, the intervention here is to go, you know, rebalance your, uh, your test and validation sets. Um, and so the, the last thing I want to kind of briefly touch on is hyperparameter tuning, because um, hyperparameter tuning is like a very, very important um, intervention and is, can be quite difficult to do. And to give you a sense of why, um, you know, for our problem, we have a bunch of um, model and optimizer choices, right? So we have this ResNet network, um, we need to decide how many layers that should have, what weight initialization it should have, um, you know, how big the, the convolutional kernel should be in each of those layers, um, and many other things. And then you know, for our atom optimizer, is that even really the right optimizer? And if it is, um, how big a batch size should we use? What learning rate should we use? Um, and you know, what about these other like, weird beta parameters for atom um, that you know, no one even really knows what they mean? Um, you know, regularization, maybe we should have some of that, right? Like there's a proliferation of different hyperparameters that we could tune, and the problem is that um, you know naively, if you think about tuning multiple hyperparameters, um, there's you know you, you kind of grow um, the number of hyperparameters you just you need to try grows the exponent of like the number of um, the number of hyperparameters that you're tuning, right? Because like if you have two hyperparameters and you're sampling grid points, then you then have like to sample to get each of the corresponding um, n squared grid points. Um, and so, you know, we need some heuristics for which hyperparameters to actually tune. The good news is um, that models are so, uh, much more sensitive to some hyperparameters than they are to others. Um, there's some bad news. The bad news is which ones those are depends on your choice of model. Uh, very, very, very sad. So, you know, I, I have some rules of thumb to the right. Um, these are really only meant to be rules of thumb, and um, and you know, and it can depend pretty wildly depending on your problem, but this is kind of the order, if I'm kind of brand new to a problem, the order I'll like to tune my hyperparameters in. Um, and so, um, you know, I think 
the, the ones that kind of stand out to me as being the, the highest priority of the institute are um, anything having to do with your learning rate, the serial learning rate, your learning rate schedule, um, then the size of your layer. So if you have you know 128 filters, or if you have um, or you have you know 512 filters, um, and then you know, your specific loss function, if you have some choice about that. Um, these are all things that like I have seen almost always make a big difference, and so they'll usually be the first things they'll try. Um, but really, there's no substitute for building intuition about your problem here. Um, and then, you know, I think then there's a question of like, once you've chosen which hyperparameters to tune, how do you actually tune them? Um, I think the simplest thing here is just to um, is to do a grid search. Um, that's in practice. I think what most practitioners actually do, and it's not terrible. Um, but something slightly better than that is a course-defined random search. And so the way this, this works is instead of um, instead of taking grid points on some like two-dimensional grid for two hyperparameters, instead you take the range of allow, allowable hyperparameters and you sample uniformly from within that range. Um, and so that's a random search. And then what's slightly better than that is a course-defined random search. So once you've found which hyperparameters work best, then you can you know you as a user can just manually go in and say. This seems like the range of hyperparameters that perform well, and resample hyperparameters from within that range. Um, somewhat manual, but tends to work very, very well. And um, Bayesian hyperparameter optimization is a very, very useful tool, um, but it's kind of notoriously difficult to implement and integrate with existing systems. So, you know, typically I'll um, incorporate something like that once the project gets much more, more mature. Okay, just um, a couple of last thoughts. Um, you know, what do I want you to take away from this? Um, you know, I think a, a, a key insight for me when I was learning about deep learning was that you know, really the reason why it's so hard to debug these models is because um, there are many sources of error that can cause the same degradation in performance. And um, so just looking at the data, just looking at the learning curve, um, does not actually tell you what's going wrong, wrong with your model. And so as a consequence of that, if our goal is to train bug-free deep learning models, then uh, what we really have to do is to treat this as an iterative process. So start with the simplest possible version of your entire pipeline, and then once you've convinced yourself that that kind of works the way you'd expect it to, then gradually layer on um, added complexity on top of that. And, um, you know, and these are a set of steps that I recommend um, that I think are really meant to help you catch uh, an error in your pipeline um, a bug as early on as you possibly can. Right. Um, when it's still easy to, to disambiguate versus like much, much later on when you have thousands of lines of code. Um, and the last thing I, I want to say is just you know, where to go to learn more. Um, I have kind of a much longer version of this guide that has more details about everything um, on my website. Um, and then um, you know, we also teach some courses on this um, called Full Stack Deep Learning. And um, then there's a book and a blog post and a Twitter thread that I also found uh, really helpful when I was kind of originally starting to put these things together. And that's all. Thank you. Performance is really bad because there's a lot of like kind of garbage data, um, but it took kind of actually like looking at a lot of examples to figure out why. Hi, um, can you go to the uh, one slide with the test error equation, the yeah. version two? Yeah, the distribution fit, so the shift. 
So, um, the way that I would actually do this is, like, let's say that you have, um, you know, a thousand images that you know are from the data distribution that you actually care about, like they're from your actual users or something like that. Um, I would still hold out, um, like, let's say 500 of those or 800 of those as test data and not look at those and be very principled about that. But I would take a subset of them and um, allow yourself to look at them more frequently. Um, because what that lets you do is to tell if you're, like if your training data is just so far off that you're producing garbage. I was just thinking, doesn't that introduce information or does it cause a problem? It doesn't cause a problem because you're not actually using, like you're basically just changing what your test set is. Okay. Um, and you're taking some data that you know looks more similar to your test set and you're using that as part of your, your training procedure. Do you have tips for uh, getting your model results to be consistent? Because I find that one problem is, for example, if you say that the model train, the model train results they have a lot of data. So if you run it multiple times, sometimes you know it uh, crashes, and sometimes it already stops really early, so you have that uh, very consistent results. And sometimes you have so sometimes the visualization of your weights um, are effective. Yeah, so um, this this can be very challenging, like particularly, um, so I think like one thing that's really nice is that um, as machine learning matures, um, people tend to converge on techniques that don't have very much variance between seeds. So like I found with, um, with state-of-the-art like vision models, for example, um, usually don't have this problem, but in, you know, at the other end of the spectrum in reinforcement learning, like, there's actually an argument to be made that most of the results that people report in like academic conferences are really just variance between seeds that's causing their model to perform better. Um, so in terms of tips, I mean, I think one thing is like, I try to be really careful about, um, about using uh, random seeds. So, um, you know, making sure that you can actually produce the exact same order of your training data every single time, like uh, twice in a row if you need to. Um, what else helps here? Do you cross validate on smaller models? Do you cross, what do you mean by that? Like, do you cross validate? Yeah, so for, for deep learning, um, we almost never use, like, uh, capable cross validation. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, other things that can be helpful, like, oftentimes, um, if you have some seeds that are diverging, um, this can be evidence that your learning rate is too high. Um, so you might just, Increase your learning rate, or um, uh, set a learning rate schedule where your learning rate, like when models start to diverge, um, right before that, your learning rate decays a little bit. Um, yeah, I think like learning rate too high is probably the most common cause of that type of divergence. Yeah, I'm curious about the uh, Sure. How about using data visualization? Yes, so um, I'm going to give you my hot take on this. I've never found any of that stuff useful at all. Um, there are some statistics uh, that you can keep track of when you're training that are useful. Um, the one that comes to mind is um, keeping track of the magnitude of the gradients. Um, that's like a signal that I've actually found to be really useful. And then in some problem domains like reinforcement learning, you kind of live and die on some of these auxiliary signals to tell you what your model is doing. But for um, for vision, like personally, I've never really found that useful. Yeah, so um, AutoML right now, my view is um, too expensive to do um, until you're like very, very far into your problem domain. Um, so like right now, like the AutoML results that are, like, the thing that's really, really useful for is, you know, people have been studying this problem for years and years and years and manually coming up with new 
model architectures. Um, you know, then um, doing some auto ML and asking your algorithm to come up with a better model architecture um, tends to bump the state of the art by, uh, by you know, a few percentage points. Right? You've seen this in um, image classification, you've seen this in, um, like, in language models and like, all different problem domains that are well studied. Um, for when you're starting out on a new problem, um, I think usually the problem is really more um, around making sure that you have the right training data, making sure that your problem is well formulated, um, and you know, and, and then like maybe coming up with some architectural ideas. But I think this is like kind of a moving from the 95th to 99th percentile thing, as opposed to a, you know, moving from zero to 90. Um, that said, like five years from now, that might be really different. Um, because we're going to have access to orders of magnitude more compute, and you know the, these auto ML algorithms will evolve um, quite a bit. And so, you know, I'm not sure what I'm not sure that that will be true. Um, you know, in the next generation of machine learning systems. Anyone else? All right, let's give another round of applause to the